So, uh, I mean, uh, what a pleasure to go on after Eddie Chang. Uh, you know, some of us have been pushing the line that there is a very, very strong role for anterior, posterior, or rostral caudal processes in, or, you know, distinctions in auditory processing and that this impacts on speech for, you know, a number of years. There's different varieties of this, but this is certainly the anterior, posterior, the, the way we can split up STG into different candidate roles is, you know, uh, delightful to see this very nice evidence that he's coming forward with. And, you know, I'm coming to this with very, very different kinds of evidence, but I think some strong elements that are supporting this distinction. Uh, so we've got a very, very crude distinction. That's going to keep happening, isn't it? What I need to do is get out of my emails because no one needs that. Um, I won't stop and read my emails. I've got some manners. There we go. So, you know, this this idea that there are these mammate, you know, uh, certainly a candidate of property of primate sensory processing is that you have these streams of processing, uh, something associated with the temporal lobes, associated with classification, you get that in the visual system as well, and something posterior, something directed caudally, which is associated more with sensory motor links. Very crudely, it's been called a sort of a, a what pathway or a how pathway distinctions. And without, you know, going into this in too much detail, the reason why um, we started pushing this kind of story as well was following the story, because that's what the data looked like when we started going into human speech perception systems in more detail. This wasn't what we set out to see. No one thought we would find this. So, you know, throughout the 90s, um, we were hunting for brain areas which we could say seemed to be really important for speech rather than more generalised aspects of auditory processing. And it took years, you know, as we were kind of refining our baselines down because we were discovering the hard way that the brain doesn't really care about your experiment and, um, and brains will show all sorts of interesting responses, all sorts of interesting st different aspects of sounds. And so we ended up with the conditions where we were trying to find using, you know, as the high level baseline sounds as we could get away with that were not intelligible as speech, which controls many of the properties of speech. When we did this, to our surprise, what we found was rostral anterior temporal lobe regions going down into STG and STS that cared about intelligibility in speech and all that that compromises. And it didn't care at all what the speech sounded like, didn't care if it sounded like a human being or not, just didn't show a sensitivity to that. And that was not what we were expecting to see. The dogma at the time was that posterior superior temporal sulcus regions uh, should be what's doing speech perception. That was what uh, Bogan and Bogan had said in their Wernicke's area paper. So, you know, it was a good example of a functional imaging studies pushing us in a different direction from what we thought we should see. And it was also when we started looking at the primate literature on the emerging auditory um, neurophysiology and neuroanatomy, very consistent with that. Complexities to this, there are some suggestions of hemispheric asymmetries. So on the whole, the right temporal lobe cares about information in voices, but it, and these same anterior fields respond. But it's a lot less interested in words and speech aspects and much more interested in, for example, aspects to do with prosody. So if we look, at, as Eddie's pointed out, you get these very distinctive. Actually, falling prosody is something that speech in non-tonal languages does at the end of sentences. It's to do with the physics of getting sounds out. But um, what you tend to get is these falling patterns of prosody. And if you manipulate the speech such that you actually flatten out the prosody profiles, ignore the, in, the emotion in this speech, just listen to the prosody. There's something without much spectral profile, but with some intelligible prosody. And here we've got this, the, with the spectral information in there. 143. Um, and if we take the prosody out, you get something more like this. 143. Flatten out prosody. To be honest, I didn't really want to do this study because I thought the flattened prosody sounds so peculiar, you're going to get unusual responses associated with that, and that's not what we found. The right temporal lobe really cares about signals that speech that has normal prosody in there. I must stress the speech. I haven't got the right example, so the speech we used wasn't emotional speech, but all speech has prosody. So there is, you know, there, are, there is a distinction in these anterior fields between the left and the right temporal lobes, certainly as you see with, with functional imaging studies. And it doesn't just apply to sentences. You see it for very small sort of shreds of speech sounds because David Popple and other people have said, well, you know, what you're, you, you go in there with sentences, you've got no idea what's driving this. So we did a study where we took speech down to the bare minimum. We presented people with unvoiced phonemes, things like... <laughs> 
And we also had ingressive click sounds, sounds like, like you find in languages such as closer. So apologies, that's a horrible um, example. But um, you make the sounds by sucking the air into your mouth. Um, and we use those because they are very common mouth sounds in English, but they're not linguistic. We, people do not process them linguistically. And there's very nice evidence from uh, Kathy Best that, in fact, English speakers process ingressive speech sounds so differently, we do not process them as speech at all. And we also had a baseline signal correlated noise. And this was, I can say without a shadow of a doubt, the most boring experiment I have ever been a participant with. I was, I was aggressively bored after lying there and listening to sequences of <coughs> or <coughs> and <laughs> it was horrendous. And again, I was very worried about what we would find from this. And interestingly, you still find a selective response to these shreds, these little bits of phonemes running forward down the temporal lobes with an emphasis on the left relative to both the baselines. I entirely accept that that could be higher order perceptual processes driving this. Because if you hear, you might hear cut or cat. You might be trying to hear words in that. In fact, when I give that example of different unvoiced speech sounds. I have to be careful the order I do it in so I don't just mouth swear words at you. And so we, you know, we, that entirely could be happening, but the input is not whole words. The input is not sentences. The input is these little bits and pieces. You're still driving these anterior temporal lobe responses. Interestingly, you are still seeing these distinctions. So the right shows a response both to the click sounds and to the phonemes. And that seems to be, again, following that voiciness. It's, it's not interested, it's interested less in the intelligibility of speech, the meaningfulness of speech, more interested in uh, sounds that can be, be emerging from a human being with a voice. And that does seem to be one of the big differences in these rostral fields between the left and the right. The right seems a lot less interested in linguistic aspects or um, probably not specific to that, but um, I'm not saying that couldn't be driven by other sorts of sounds. But certainly the right seems to care about... Voices, things that our human beings are producing, and the sort of acoustics associated with that. We also ran a study where we kept the acoustics the same, and we had a face present, and the, 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 it was a speaker talking, and all that varied was that the talker looked in different directions. And when the talker was looking at you, or looking away from you, or looking down, or her eyes were masked, we used noise vocoded speech so people had to look at the talker, otherwise it was very hard to understand. What we were interested in was the condition where she's looking at you, because some interesting responses have been shown in the superior temporal gyrus and sulcus on the right, responding to eye gaze by Andy Calder and colleagues in Cambridge, and we worked with Andy to see what would happen if that person wasn't just looking at you or not, they're also talking to you. So people are just seeing the speaker looking in different directions and you always hear her. And what you find is that doesn't improve intelligibility. It's hard to understand the speech and it's no better when she's looking at you. But you still get an increased activation in the left anterior temporal lobe, specifically associated with the talker looking at you. This seems to be something to do with salience. So you don't have to drive this acoustically. You can be driving this by some or hear visual input and probably to do with maybe attentional mechanisms and meaning. It just means something different when a talker is looking at you. And of course, that's not the end of the language system. This is the way into the language system. If you do something like add in more participants and increase your power, you see the activation spreading out from the temporal lobe. And if you do something like let context help you understand what the sentences mean, again, you see these far greater um, linguistic systems in the left temporal lobe recruited. But it's kind of, it's a way in, perhaps, this anterior classification system. It's a way into the language system. Those are clearly not selective for only one thing at a time, as was cropping up in the questions to Eddie. Most of the time when we are in acoustic environments, we're not in silent acoustic environments, although we like to play our stimuli to, in silence to people. That's not the norm. So what we've been looking at over a number of different studies is what happens when the speech you're listening to is masked. And it can be masked by energetic mechanisms such as um, continuous white noise, like an a air, air conditioner or a fan or an oven, or it can be masked by another talker. And that seems to have different mechanisms. That's associated with what's called informational masking. And that seems to be to do with aspects of the, the talker you're trying to ignore 
getting through and competing centrally. And what you find is if you scan people listening to speech against a variety of different background noise, what you find is very general mechanisms recruited to deal with any sound, and that's shown here in blue. No matter what the masking sound, you see these very non-specific systems look like, again, largely attentional systems recruited to deal with the fact that listening is difficult because there's other sound going on. What we also find is within the temporal lobes in these speech areas, and again running particularly forward down the temporal lobe, responses to the unattended speech. You get activation associated with the talker that you are not listening to. This is how the central mechanism, how the competition is occurring. And of course we know this from the, the, you know, the kind of classic cocktail party effect that I'm sure you know, is familiar to you from all the cocktail parties you go to. But the idea that when you're listening to somebody speaking and there's other talkers going on, if there is something relevant in those other talkers, you will notice it. If someone says your name or if somebody shouts fire, that information will get through. So this seems to be the mechanism for you seeing this. And what this must mean in practice is that we're glimpsing patterns of activation in these anterior temporal lobes that must reflect far greater complexity because it can clearly cope with multiple streams or auditory objects that are simultaneously present in the environment and be processing them simultaneously. So we must be looking at a lot of parallel processing within the superior temporal gyrus, which is presumably a capability which is being tested all the time when we're listening in more noisy environments. Interestingly, we've recently run the same experiment where instead of having people listening to speech against masking sounds, we have them speaking against masking sounds, and you get exactly the same phenomenon when you are speaking against another talker. Loads of activation running forward down the temporal lobe associated with the person against whose voice you are speaking. If anything, it seems to progress even further if you are talking and there's speech going on. It seems to get even further into the system. We must be seeing multiple streams of processing happening in the superior temporal gyrus. And in fact, very generally, it's a kind of crude description, uh, not, not in any kind of a model, but just a description of the sort of thing we see recruiting these our interior temporal areas. We can see it associated with aspects of hierarchical processing. So if you simply look at different aspects of acoustic information being built up in the signal, that runs forward down the temporal lobe. It's highly flexible. It seems to be able to deal with a lot of the, the variation in the different kinds of inputs. So for example, it doesn't necessarily care what the talker sounds like if you can understand what that talker is saying. It can cope with multiple auditory objects and we tend to be interested in the one that you select out and pay attention to, but it's also processing the stuff that you are not attending to if it has informational value, if there's information in there that can be got out. It's associated with asymmetries between the left and the right temporal lobes. It seems to be important in classification and recognition, and that seems to be going beyond just speech, because you can see, for example, um, it's hard to go in with other things that we might be able to classify that are not some way contaminated with speech, but a study with people who have perfect pitch, and the definition of perfect pitch is being able to identify pitches. Musicians with perfect pitch, compared to musicians who don't have perfect pitch, when they are listening to sequences and holding them in working memory, the ones with perfect pitch activate these anterior temporal lobe regions more. Now, of course, classification of a pitch still involves naming it, so... Maybe I might just be re-describing language this way, but it certainly doesn't suggest that you have to be driving it with speech to get there. We've also got it mapping into the semantic system when you, that seems to be the part of the destination for information in this route. You're seeing fields in the anterior temporal pole and ventral temporal areas associated with a modal semantic representations seem to be associated with this profile of activation. It interacts with the visual system, which is, of course, consistent with the fact that you've got the ventral visual stream running along the bottom of the temporal lobe, so you're sort of anatomically in the right place for these two systems to be talking to each other. And it doesn't seem to be generally associated with your own voice. In fact, if anything, a lot of these anterior fields are the ones that are strongly suppressed when you are talking. And I'll come back to that. Now, of course, there are all these caudal areas what would we see associated with that? Well, here we've got a completely different study. This is a study where we were looking at people's memory, online rehearsal 
of non-words and we were manipulating aspects of the non-words and as a baseline we had a separate group of participants who just heard the non-words and we were varying the length of the non-words in terms of syllables and also their phonetic complexity and in the group of people who weren't doing any kind of rehearsal they were just listening to non-words if you look at what brain areas increase as you activate as you increase the length of the non-words it's all running posteriorly it's all going into these caudal areas you're not seeing it people aren't trying to understand it and it also seems to be highly involved in speech production. So this is just an example of a speech production network. It's an extremely common network. You get lateral sensory motor cortex, cerebellum, subcortical fields, supplementary motor area, and lots of activation in the superior temporal gyrus with a weight towards the back end of the superior temporal gyrus. If we go into that in more detail, we can start, um, which I'm going to do now, we can actually start to see some of these ways that we're using chordal auditory fields to guide production. One thing I would say, and this is picking up very much on Keith's talk this morning, is of course we also need to think about plasticity and flexibility within the speech itself. Because again, the sort of speech we normally use, and I've always used in my perceptual studies, is extremely well articulated, very slow speech like this. The clown had a funny face. The clown had a funny face. It's extremely clear. You can use this for testing intelligibility. There is almost nothing naturalistic about that production. Now, if we compare this to another recording of speech, this is me in the anechoic chamber. I'm going to have to suggest that somebody comes in with me because I'm not... So what I'm asking there is for someone to come talk, someone to come and watch videos with me because we're trying to make recordings of laughter and I was finding I wasn't laughing on my own. So what I'm doing there is I'm asking for something that I want to happen. <laughs> and I'm trying to ask it really nicely with people I know. And it's really under-articulated and fast. I'm extremely casual in my speech because I'm in a very casual setting. I'm not producing speech here that I would ever hope somebody would use in the scanner. Although, of course, obviously we should be. So there's a huge amount of variety there. I was producing very, very under-articulated speech. I'm sort of, instead of saying, I'm going to have to ask for somebody to come in here with me, I'm, I'm saying something more along the lines of, I'm going to have to ask someone to come in here with me. And it's, it's phenomenally underproduced, and it, it worked. Nobody said, well, what's going on in there? The people understood me perfectly because of all the stuff Keith talked about for the context. So what you're seeing here is speech has got to be highly plastic, both in terms of the systems involved in perceiving it and in terms of producing it because the context will totally affect how a talker is talking. So there, the first example of the clown had the funny face. The syllable durations were coming in at an average of 300 milliseconds, which is super long. For I'm going to have to suggest the, the syllable duration was less than half that. The vowels are highly reduced in that more casual speech that I gave you. The consonants reduced or completely omitted. And it's full of errors. Uh, technically, but of course I wasn't correcting anything and the talkers I was, people I was talking to weren't confused by what it meant. So it's working as a signal. We can clearly deal with it. And I really want to think about this when we're thinking about these caudal auditory areas and speech production because this is there in speech production all the time. We tend to think of speech production as being a very kind of, like the, the, uh, a, a fixed way of producing a linguistic signal, but everything that's leading to plasticity and the signals listeners have to deal with is there in the systems that are controlling why someone sounds that way to start with. So we speak differently based on background noise, the Lombard effect that was mentioned earlier, the social settings. I speak completely differently if I'm talking to my son's school teacher than if I'm trying to buy fruit on Chapel Market, where I'm trying to be all kind of cockney with the people I'm shopping with. Because um, that's what the Cockneys, that's where the Cockneys live. If you don't know about London, that's the Chapel Market, that's where they all are. Um, it depends on who you're talking to. People will change their voice depending on who they're talking to. Men will raise the pitch of their voice depending on how much they like the woman they're talking to. Just let that one ripple through the room. Try that one out at lunch. Hello. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I talk like my mum when I've been on the phone to her. Don't, you know, don't really want to love my mum, don't really want to sound like her, but it's, you know, I, I kind of align my voice because I can all this stuff, I can show about our relationship by how I'm doing this. And even the aims, the how we wish people to see us. I'm talking very differently here to you now than if I was talking to all the villainous cockneys selling fruit on Chapel Market. So this has to be implemented somewhere in this speech production network. And my slides aren't going forward, sorry, hang on. Okay, so somewhere within this, this plasticity is lying. 
And I'm very interested in the role of these posterior auditory areas because if you look at those same STG fields that I was just thinking about in terms of perception, this is actually a production task. This was done by Zarina Agnew. Here people are being scanned where they're either saying sentences, mouthing sentences while they hear somebody else talking. They don't think it's their voice, but there's, there's sound going on. Or they're just listening to sentences. You get the same rostral caudal distinction there. These posterior auditory areas, and in fact going up into inferior parietal cortex, are activated when you speak, even if you speak. And the anterior region shown here in yellow, so the regions that are more strongly associated to listening to somebody else in perception tasks, are actually suppressed. And they're suppressed when you speak aloud, and they're also suppressed. So it's not, it's not just a question of somehow responding to the sound of your own voice. The evidence from non-human primates seems to be that these suppression effects are launched prior to the onset of articulation. So before you start the act of speaking, you're turning off these fields. Um, and I'm very interested in this in terms of the, what might be happening when we change our voices. Here's an extreme example of somebody changing his voice. He's speaking under delayed auditory feedback, so he's hearing his own voice come back to him at a delay of about 200 milliseconds. No, exactly 200 milliseconds. 200 milliseconds. Understanding the constraints on Kennedy, Hannah and Hesberg wanted the Commission to exert counter-pressure by having special access to the White House through a liaison. Kennedy said that Harris Wofford, whom he had made a special, a full-time specialist assistant on civil rights, was already on the job, which was false. But Hatner and Hesberg responded to the Wofford. So I, I, I didn't scan him. <laughs> Um, because I was, this, I, was, I was trying to pilot people to find people who could keep talking under this condition. It's a very peculiar condition. You, we're always talking under delay because if, as soon as you're in a reverberant environment, there is echoes of your voice coming back to you. This is quite a reverberant room to be speaking in. And up to about 50 milliseconds, you're fine. Your auditory system, your subcortical auditory pathway can just clear those sounds up. About 50 milliseconds, it becomes noticeable, and 200 milliseconds, it becomes really difficult to speak, and people become very disfluent, they stop talking. People that can keep going tend to change their voice a lot, they tend to flatten out their prosody, and sometimes they start speaking very loudly and trying to drown out the sounds. But there's a lot of different strategies people use, but it's definitely everyone's voice is changed by this. And there are a number of studies now which have used delayed auditory information like this or changing the pitch of somebody's voice when they're speaking or having somebody speak against different noisy environments. And without going to them in detail, what my PhD student Sophie Meekings has recently done is a meta-analysis looking at studies that have addressed this um, to try and get a feeling for exactly where and how is different, very different ways of changing how people are talking when they're speaking because everyone will speak differently under all of those conditions. How is this being controlled? And what you find is it's back in caudal auditory fields. It's running very slightly forward, not very far forward on the left, but the weight is right at the back. Um, can I borrow you, Josh, for just a second? Yeah. So this is another way that you can change the voice. I want you to stand up, please. I'm sorry you've got a computer. Now, can you see this? No. Can you see this? Yes. Okay. Can you just read those first sentences with me aloud, okay? Starting where? The barrel, the barrel though, though, may have, may have been, been strung on, on Margaret after, after her death. death. The, the picture was cleaned in 1973, and studies suggested that, that some original features have, have almost been. vanished. Okay? So that's synchronous speech. Thank you. You can sit down. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, don't, anyone can do this, literally anyone can do this. It's a very common use of human speech. It's, very, it's universally found in prayer. People um, use this in protest. And people, you know, the, the US, when people pledge allegiance, you use synchronous speech. Very often, if you want people to act as one, you get them to talk together. And we did a study on this because a lot of people do when they align their voices like that. So we immediately started breathing together and we aligned the rhythm and the prosody of our voices. We didn't discuss it. It's almost like we fall straight onto these stereotypical ways of speaking. And I was very interested in how you negotiate this, and also because a lot of the timings involved in it are not dissimilar to how people time conversational speech. So this is it's kind of tiptoeing up on conversational speech. When you do this, 
what you find is these exact same posterior auditory regions are recruited. So when you are aligning your voice to somebody else, you're actually still relying heavily on these posterior auditory fields. So these auditory areas really do seem to be how you are using information about the sounds out there in the world with which you are aligning or changing or modifying your voice and then can the controlling the adaptations you need to do beyond that seem to be things largely associated with these posterior auditory areas. One exception for this was we actually had in our study two different synchronization conditions and we didn't tell the participants. Half the time they were synchronizing with somebody live sitting out in the scanner control room and the other half of the time they were synchronizing with a recording of them and people didn't notice but they're much more accurate when they're doing it with a live person because you converge together. Brain reg these posterior regions didn't distinguish. Posterior auditory areas are recruited in the same way when you align your voice with somebody else regardless of how you're doing it. The only difference between the live and the recorded condition was these anterior auditory areas that show suppression normally when you're speaking a very strong release from suppression when you synchronise your voice with someone who is actually speaking with you. Now, we don't think this is some mystical ability to detect actual live human beings. This is probably because of the synchrony you achieve when you're synchronising with a live person. It's much, much tighter. It's like 50 milliseconds. That seems to be how you actually start to hear your own voice and some of these suppression mechanisms. So, in short... Um, this is clearly the start of a story about rostral and caudal pathways. There's much more to know about this. I'm delighted and I want to know more about the sort of stuff Eddie was talking about. But I'm showing you, you know, kind of systems level stuff across participants and across brain regions. We still see things that are corresponding to it and which seem to fall into distinctly different patterns. These anterior pathways associated with mal massively plastic, flexible, multiple auditory objects classification pathways, whereas these posterior core regions, they don't seem to show the same kind of very specific aspects of responses to different kinds of sounds. Possibly a reduced acoustic sensitivity, I don't, you know, I'm not pushing that, doesn't seem to map directly into semantic processing, seems to be much more linked to sensory motor processing, and it seems to be very centrally involved in guidance of sound production it's interacting with somatic sensation it's recruited more when we change our voices clearly the two don't operate independently and I think any one study that we do we kind of emphasize one more than the other depending on the stimuli we use and the task we use so this is a study where we were asking people to speak and we were asking them to try and talk with different identities we were giving people we asked people for a list of people they could try and speak like um, we, we actually had to, we couldn't just get people in for our normal subject panel because you can't just put somebody into the scanner and then say, talk like Margaret Thatcher. People, people won't do it. We learned that the hard way. So we got people to suggest names of people who could have a go at impersonating. And it didn't matter if they were any good. The point is they are trying to change their voice. And when they try to sound like a different person, what you see is a recruitment of speech production networks that work harder to do this. You also get a strong involvement in right anterior auditory areas associated with what you would use to listen to other people. So clearly, we can see the two working together. And just finally, there's probably also something very important here about actually the mechanics and the mechanisms of the things with which we are making the sound. Because we don't tend to think, for example, of speech production as an expertise. We certainly don't think of it as a, like an instrumental task, but it's something we learn to do. It's something we learn to spend a lot of time learning to perceive and produce speech. And we did a study recently where we deliberately wanted to look at the kind of what the effects would be of that kind of expertise, which we can't normally do with speech because everyone's in our normal population is generally good at it. So what we did is we took two different kinds of um, instrumentalists. We took guitar players, electric guitar players, and we took beatboxers. I'm not going to beatbox, but beatboxers are those people who can kind of produce polyphonic music with their mouths, and it tends to be very, very uh, strongly percussive. It's, a lot of its origins, people, uh, like in, in early days of hip hop, you'd have a beatboxer doing a drum track for you while somebody else rapped. So you've kind of got this kind of strongly percussive element. And what we did was we just had people listening, listening to novel examples of very good electric guitar playing and novel examples of very good beatboxing. And we also had a group of people who could neither beatbox nor play the electric guitar. And what you see 
is that when the musicians are listening to an instrument which they can play, and they know how to make those sounds, even if they don't necessarily know how, what that piece of music is, they know how to make that instrument make those sounds, what you get is an extremely common pattern of activation, very strongly emphasising sensory motor areas rather than, say, the classification network, they are recruited in almost exactly the same way, although they're using very different effectors. So the electric guitar players are doing it with their hands and the beatboxers are mostly doing it with their, their torso and their articulators. So there's clearly a great deal more to know about actually the origins of the expertise that people have got. By the time we're scanning them, there's a whole other story there. These posterior networks, for example, seem to be very tuned to sounds that you know how to make. And Jane Warren... Jason Warren and Richard Wise have written about that with the voice, but I suspect there might be a whole other set of things we could think about in terms of ways people make noises in the world. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for Eddie for a fantastic talk, and thank you very much for inviting me to the whole meeting. It's been really interesting. Thank you. Thank you.